Good morning, church. I hope you, you've had a, a great week. If you've been off with children, uh, with family, um, I, Zoe and I had a bit, couple, of de- couple of days. I had managed to have a, a couple of days um, actually on a, a couple of days retreat, which is not something I've done for a very long time. And um, just um, spending some time with the Lord, seeking his presence on a, on a couple of things. So um, we've had a great week in the Dickinson household, um, celebrating my wife's birthday as well, which happens to be today. And I'm, um, I happen to be preaching all day, so we celebrated it yesterday. And um, great to welcome you if you're new and you're visiting us. My name's Gareth, part of the team here. Great to welcome you if you're new. And do stick around, as Holly said, join us for tea and coffee. And um, look forward to welcoming some other newcomers um, to the church. Um, Tim and Hills Grew, who are newcomers um, to the church. Welcome back. If someone could point them in the direction to the welcome point afterwards and then for tea and coffee afterwards, that would be fab. Welcome back. Great to have you back with us. I know you've had a great time and uh, we're looking forward to just uh, hearing all that the Lord's been doing um, and I uh, hope you're rested and I'm um, and, uh, really sorry to tell you that Manchester are still top of the league. Um, it is actually City, not United, but it is Manchester anyway, nonetheless. I'll take whatever I can get. Arsenal creeping up in fifth position. Well, we're in our teaching series. Um, If you've got a Bible, um, turn it on to Matthew uh, chapter 5. If you're a bit old school, turn the page to uh, Matthew chapter 5, wherever you are. Um, Let's get into the New Testament. And as Holly said, we're in this teaching series um, in the autumn term as we um, revolve around um, this key verse of the Old Testament, Micah chapter 6. Verse 8, he has shown you, a mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah writing in the 8th century, writing to um, the people of God who are in essence um, in rebellion. They think they're doing all the right things, they're doing all the religious things, but in fact their hearts are not aligned with God. And we're asking ourselves those questions as well. As we continue, we're, we're asking the question, what does it mean today for us to walk humbly with God? And what does it mean to walk humbly with God, particularly through all seasons of our life? Through all seasons of our life. Perhaps um, particularly as we seek, as a church, to live out the kingdom of God. What does it mean for us here in Trinity Cheltenham to live out the kingdom of God? I love what Mal and Nobby and Marion are doing with Transforming Work UK in the workplace. What does it mean to live out the kingdom of God and the mission that God's called Mal and Nobby and Marion and, and you if you, you have a, a, a work um, role throughout um, the week? And what does it mean to live out the kingdom of God? If you don't have a job, what does it mean in other spheres that you might find yourself in, whether it's with family, whether it's friends, whether it's with neighbors, whether it's with your children, um, if you're a parent, two parents at home? What does it mean for us to live out the mission of the kingdom of God? That's what we're thinking as we seek to walk humbly. And perhaps the most uh, concise teaching that we find in the Bible, and particularly in the New Testament, of life in the kingdom of God comes from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's where we're going to sit this morning in the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5. And the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known, I would say, of Jesus' teaching. Um, I don't know if you've... um, if anyone's got one of those books of greatest speeches that have ever been told, um, I've got one of those books. And, you know, Martin Luther King Jr.'s there. I had a dream. And, you know, there's probably a couple of American presidents in there in, uh, with their incredible speeches. And Jesus is in the, the book of speeches that I've got, and particularly the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of his incredible, well-known teachings that many people are familiar with. But I wonder how much we engage with what Jesus teaches us here about the kingdom of God. It it could be said that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' manifesto of life in the kingdom. What life is like to, to all those who seek to follow Jesus 
with their lives, what he wants us to do, how he wants us to live, how he wants us to be with each other. And some, there's some incredible teaching about married life, about relationships, about, about finances, how we treat, each, treat one another. And thank you, by the way, if you gave to the gift day. Thank you for being so generous in that. And um, we're still praying through um, our gift day and our, our finances as a church, so there's still opportunity to give if you would like. So Jesus' manifesto, Matthew chapter 5, and this Sermon on the, on the Mount portrays um, a changed life. Um, what, um, the word that's used so often in the Bible of a changed life is a repentance, a turning around, the metanoia, the changing of mind, the changing of the way of the mind that affects the behavior, that affects how we seek to live our life. That's what the Sermon on the Mount, in essence, is about. It's about a repentance, but it's also about a, a life of righteousness. And we've looked at that, haven't we, in terms of justice and righteousness coming out of Micah chapter 6, verse 8. The right way of living. And the right way of living belongs to the king. The right, the right way of living belongs to the kingdom of God. And the right way of living belongs to the people who seek to follow the king and live in the kingdom of God. So this section we're going to look at is the first 12 verses. Um, familiar words, I am sure, to many of us. The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Blessed are. So let's dig in if we can. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Now when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they, they, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So let's dig in. The Beatitudes of Jesus, familiar words, familiar phrases, familiar proclamations of Jesus to many of us, I'm sure. But what does Jesus mean when he says, be blessed? What does it mean to uh, be blessed? Well, the original word that's used um, here in the text for being blessed is often translated as happy. Happy are those who are poor in spirits. Happy are those who mourn. And it's used to describe people who are particularly favored by God. They're happy because there is this, um, this posture in their life and they know the favor of God. But I want to throw a bit of a different slant on that, if I may. The happiness of those who are, know the favor of God in their life. And that's partly because I, I was coming, uh, reading a commentary and I, and I came across um, just um, an insight which I hadn't seen before. And, and basically this biblical commentator said that in the first century, in the ancients of, of Greek, they would often ascribe in the ancient Greek world um, this phrase, blessed. And it was often used to congratulate or to applaud or to cheer people on because they had experienced the benefits or the wealth or the, or the estate of the gods. And so the slight kind of angle I want to throw on this this morning is, is the sense that God applauds us when we seek to live humbly in the ways that Jesus outlines here 
as people in the kingdom of God. He applauds us. He cheers us on. He congratulates us when we demonstrate these characteristics that he teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount. So what I'm saying is that in some sense, Jesus is saying that God congratulates the poor in spirit. He applauds those who are weak. It's almost like Jesus is saying, I'm cheering you on if you passionately pursue righteousness. God applauds us when we demonstrate these kingdom characteristics. So what does it mean when Jesus says that we're blessed? It says that God congratulates us. God applauds us. And that's how we're going to read these Beatitudes. And what I'm going to do very quickly, you'll be surprised by this, I know, um, is go through each of the eight Beatitudes, give a little bit of a commentary about each of the Beatitudes. And my prayer is this. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit, as we listen to him, that the Holy Spirit maybe might pinpoint one or two areas in our lives, one or two areas in your life, one or two areas in my life that God wants us to grow in. So consider this a, perhaps a little bit of a, of a spiritual health check. You might later on want to go and re- reread the, the Beatitudes, the eight um, Beatitudes for yourself and maybe put a, a, a tick or underline it in, the, in your Bible or highlight it if you've got one on your phone or iPad, whatever. But let's, um, let's ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us areas in our life that he wants us to grow in at this season. And what might, be the, what might be the Holy Spirit be saying to me might be different for you. So firstly, God applauds the poor in spirit. What does Jesus mean when God applauds the poor in spirit? This has nothing to do with poverty. Poverty is not good in itself. Jesus isn't endorsing, you know, social exploitation or slums or starvation or hungry or those who are without need. That's not what Jesus is saying. To be poor in spirit is to be poor in the inward. It's not about the external circumstances that we might find ourselves. And what's most important is that we know our spiritual poverty. What does it mean to be spiritually poor? I think it means to know that without God, there is nothing. It means that we recognize that we are totally and utterly dependent on him for everything. What are the words of Jesus in John 15? For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you want to see some fruitfulness in your life, We have to do it with utter dependence on Jesus. So it's an acknowledgement that without God, we're poor. We are spiritually bankrupt without God in our life. And that requires a posture of surrender, I think. So I wonder when was the last time that you went through a a process of surrendering, that you surrendered your life to God, you surrendered your finances to God, you surrendered your marriage to God, you surrendered your work to job, you, to God, you surrendered. When was the last time you went through perhaps a, a time of praying through areas in your life where you say, Lord, help me to surrender? I don't know about you, I'm an ESTJ. That means I like to have hold of things. Some might say control. I think that's a wrong use of the word, wrong interpretation. But, you know, I like, I like detail. I like to know that things are happening. I like to make things happen. And one of the things I know is my weakness is I, I hold on to stuff. And I have to battle with some of my personality traits that have not gone through God's purifying, purifying fire. You know, it's easy, isn't it, to live the Christian life if we do it in our own strength, in our own competencies, and in our own skills. We could get on, can't we? Whether we would be fruitful and whether it would have a kingdom impact is another matter. Are we poor in spirit? 
Do we recognize that without God, we are nothing, that we are to be utterly, utterly, totally dependent on him for everything? You know, um, Jesus models this for us, doesn't he, in Gethsemane. When a broken man in the Garden of Eden with his friends asleep, he cries out to God, God, if it's possible that this isn't the way, your way, but not my will, but yours. I don't know if you've ever had some Gethsemane moments you know, God, if, it's not, if, it do, if I don't have to go through it this way, that'd be really great. I would love that. But Lord, your will, not mine. God applauds the poor in spirit when we surrender our lives and we say, yours is the kingdom. Secondly, God applauds those who mourn. God applauds those who mourn. Mourn for what? Well, if the first beatitude has to do with spiritual poverty, and I think it does, and that hopeless state of um, humanity before God apart from grace, then the second, I think, refers to the mourning of sin. The mourning of our sinfulness. The mourning of sinfulness in the world. And if that's correct then the comfort promised by Jesus is the comfort of the good news. The good news that there is hope, that there is life beyond our own sinfulness. There is life beyond evil and wicked and corruption in the world. There is life and life in all of its fullness, Jesus said. Jesus, I think, is referring to Isaiah when Isaiah said this to the people of God. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. What good news. Jesus is inviting us to grieve over what grieves God. And there is plenty in our world that grieves God, isn't there? Because we feel some of that. We grieve over some of it ourselves. But so often, our culture can create an inoculation where we become immune because we see so much of it in the world. We see so much of it in our own doorstep. Um, you know, those who are homeless or in need or who are begging on, in, in Cheltenham High Street just out, outside Monsoon or, or if it's just down by um, Calf House. You know, those that our mercy, mercy ministries are engaged with through King's Table and our street teams that, that support. You know, some, is there a danger that we become immune to the sinfulness and the, and the wrongdoing that is in our world? Because we see it so much. And sometimes I think in our life, we need to go through a little bit of a control-alt-delete you know, we've got to have a spiritual reboot. We've got, to re we've got to kind of stop and pause and reflect and say, no, that is not right. And that sense of God's righteousness and his mercy and his justice starts to rise in the people of God and says, we must do something. We must respond. We cannot allow this to be the, the state and the, and the way that things are in our world, in Cheltenham, in our culture, in our workplace. God applauds us when we weep for our world. Because it demonstrates that our hearts are aligned with his. Because God weeps. I wonder when was the last time you wept for our world? I wonder when was the last time I wept for our world? Thirdly, God applauds the meek. God applauds the meek. And I think so often we think that, that meek um, is, is that word that in our culture is often used for, for someone who's weak or lacking in spirit. Someone who's you know, often imposed upon or perhaps even cowardly. They don't have a bit of a backbone, someone who's weak. That's what our culture might say, but that's not what Jesus means. You know, Moses was one of the meekest men of his day. And he was anything but cowardly. He was strong of character. A better word for meek might be gentle. 
A better word might be gentle, but even that has to be explained. It's, it's the gentleness of love in action. It's the gentleness of self-discipline. And above all, it's the quiet trusting and submitting to God. Someone who's meek sits in a posture of quietly trusting the Lord. I know that he is for me. I know that he, um, I, can, I can trust him. I know that my life is in his hands and there is no better place than being in the hands of God. You know, a number of the Beatitudes, Jesus is actually referring back to some of the Old Testament passages and often it's the Psalms. And here Jesus is referring to Psalm 37, which says, the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. The psalmist then goes to explain and expand on that phrase in itself and says, you know, the people who live with that posture, they don't fret. They don't worry because of the evil that's in the world. They trust in the Lord and do good. They delight in the Lord. They're still before him and refrain from anger. There's a sense for the meek person. I wonder if you're someone who's meek that there's a calm demeanor. There's a, don't worry. We're trusting in the Lord. We're journeying with the Lord. There's a stillness about that posture. I, don't, I wonder if you know someone like that. You know, um, one of the people that I know that I think of when I think of someone who's meek, who's, who has that posture of stillness, is John Hughes, if you know him. You know, he was a former vicar of um, St. John's Harbour, and he's on the leadership of New Wine and um, WTC. But, but John is someone that just carries this posture of what I would say, just the presence of God, that stillness. I'm sure it's not like that for him all the time. But whenever I've encountered him, I've felt, you know what? I think I've just met with Jesus. Because there's something about his posture and his demeanor that is so Jesus. I wonder if that's said of you. I wonder if that's said of me. Fourthly, God applauds those who hunger and thirst for righteousness in the world. In Matthew's gospel, righteousness refers to life that expresses itself in right living, in right deeds. The people Jesus describes in this verse are those who they want to be righteous, they want to do what is right, and that's where we're sitting, isn't it, in Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to do the righteous thing, to do the right thing in the world? God, Jesus is applauding those who want to live the upright way of living. But it's not just someone who lives that way for themselves, it's also someone who pursues it in the world that sees the right way of living in the world. I wonder if that's said of you in your workplace. I wonder if that will be said of you tomorrow, that you are pursuing the right way and the right manner of doing things in the world. Those who are applauded by God, who are followers of Jesus, are women and men who pursue justice and mercy in the world. I wonder if that's true of us. That we're a people that seek to passionately pursue justice and mercy in our world. I wonder if you've um, ever felt hungry or thirsty. You're probably thinking about it now, your Sunday roast. Ever felt hungry? Ever, ever been through your, your working day and thought, oh, it's three o'clock, I've not had, so, had lunch. That's why I'm so grumpy. That's sometimes said of me occasionally. Um, that's not true, is it, Carrots? No, it's not. Uh, I usually have to have my Twix fix. Most people in the office know that if by three o'clock Gareth hasn't had his Twix fix, then um, he could be in danger of um, grumpiness. Um, but I wonder, you know, if you, if you don't have a meal, if, you, if that changes your posture. I wonder if you um, do exercise and you do running or cycling or you go down to the gym. You know, you know your need for thirst, don't you? You know you need water to rehydrate your body. And Jesus is picking up on these physical needs, these physical urgencies that we have that can, and, 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 and projects it onto righteousness. Are we hungering and thirsting for righteousness? I'd love a yes. 
Thank you. God applauds his people who passionately pursue what is right and just in our world. Fifthly, God applauds the merciful. The fifth, sixth, and seventh of the Beatitudes of Jesus begin with blessed, or God applauds the merciful. And Jesus goes on to describe the inner conviction or the inner disposition of the follower of Jesus. They reflect the heart. They reflect our heart. Jesus is merciful. Jesus is pure in heart. And Jesus always is ready to make peace. But mercy is first. Why? Because we ourselves have experienced the mercy of God, haven't we? We've experienced the mercy of God at the cross. Our sin, in our sinfulness, we deserve punishment. But God, rich in his mercy, sent his son, Jesus, for us. And as such, we're to offer that mercy that so often is undeserved in our world to others. I wonder if you're someone that offers mercy because someone's good and nice and you like them. Or do we offer mercy to the people that we find the hardest at work? The person that really gets our goat, the person that really irritates us. Maybe it's a person in church. I wonder if we're merciful to them. Jesus promises that if we do offer mercy that we ourselves will receive mercy upon mercy upon mercy from God himself anyone need the mercy of God yeah you know when when the emergency services arrive at a road traffic accident whether it's the fire service or the ambulance service and someone's been driving so fast they've overturned their car and they're, they're, they're in the car and the fire service have got the, to cut them out the, the, the firefighter doesn't say to them what, you know, the first thing they do isn't to say well you were driving so fast you really got your just desserts did they? they don't say that they get the cutters, they cut them out and they save their life that's what mercy does Mercy seeks to bring change, salvation for the better of the whole person. Mercy gets actively involved in helping those who are in need. Is that said of you and me? Sixthly, God applauds the pure in heart. Again, another beatitude of Jesus that he takes from the book of the Psalms. Psalm 24, we read this. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? The answer comes, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. There's that sense in which it's the pure heart. It's the one who seeks to be cleansed. It's the one who seeks to shun sin. The one who seeks to live for God. The one who seeks to have their eyes on God and live for God. That one gets to encounter God. And sin, wrongdoing in our lives, or things that we don't do for God that he calls us to do and we know that he's called us to do but we fail to do, those things can become a barrier to our relationship with God, to our encounter with God. Are there things in your life, are there things in my life that become a barrier to encountering God, to seeing God? What is there in your heart, perhaps Jesus might be saying, that he wants to purify today? What might the Holy Spirit say to you today? Maybe it's a grievance towards someone. Maybe it's a a view that you've held of someone that you know actually isn't true, but you know, you just have got so irritated with them, you just think, well, whatever. Maybe God wants to purify your heart. I know, as we were, as we were worshipping 
um, I just saw this big kind of like um, stone vat of this hot, molten, um, let's, it doesn't matter what it was, but it, it, metal. And um, you know, I was just reminded that you know, foundry makers, I think I've got this right, I was an engineer and worked in a foundry for a little bit of time, not that much. But you know, foundry makers, when the, when the, when the molten metal is, um, is at temperature, they, they have this, this scoop, this ladle, and they, they take off the impurities. They just scoop it off. Because in the fire, it all comes to the surface, and it's easy to get rid of that which has contaminated the metal. You know, are there things where God, by his purifying fire sign of the work of the Holy Spirit that God wants to scoop out. That's not you. You don't, you, you don't want that. I don't want you to have that. Come on, let's deal with that. Let's, let's, let's get rid of that. Are there things that the Lord is wanting to cleanse our hearts? You know, David, one of the greatest kings of Israel in the New Testament, someone who was denoted as someone whose heart was after God, you know, David himself knew about sin and he knew about his own sinfulness and he knew uh, the precious um, posture of being in the presence of God. And in Psalm 51, it's a psalm I think we should all personally read regularly as part of our daily devotions. So he says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, love and compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And a little bit later in verse 11, he says, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Where would we be as followers of Jesus without the presence of Jesus? Where would we be without the, the work of the Holy Spirit at work in us? We would just be dust. Because it's the Holy Spirit who is the bringer of life. God applauds those who invite God's cleansing spirit. I wonder if for you today, I wonder if you're here today and you just know you need some, a good dose of confession. You know, confession is good for the soul. I know we don't do it regular here as part of our, our liturgy. We, we often do when we celebrate the Lord's um, Supper communion together. But confession is a good discipline of a follower of Jesus. I wonder how good you are at your confession. I spent ages on my retreat on confession, a little bit more than I really wanted to, but I think that was the Lord. Seventhly, God applauds the peacemakers. Those who not only seek to be peaceful, but seek to make peace. Are you someone that's known to be a peacemaker in your workplace? Are you someone who's a peacemaker in your community? Are you a peacemaker with your mums, with your, with your dads, with your mates down the pub? Are you someone that seeks to help bring reconciliation and restoration of relationships? That's part of the DNA. That's part of, part of a characteristic of what it means to be a kingdom follower of Jesus, that we seek to make peace. Are we someone that creates environments for peace to be made and for peace to thrive. And lastly, God applauds those who are persecuted because of righteousness. God applauds those who are persecuted because of righteousness. This last beatitude of Jesus, he states very briefly in verse 10 and then in verses 11 and 12, he builds on it. And he, and he comments to the fact that this is where the prophets have been before. Before you, they were persecuted for me. And it's because of righteousness, because of right living. It's not necessarily because they go out proclaiming the gospel and, and telling people that they need to you know, find faith on the streets. It's not about necessarily telling your, your mates and work colleagues or neighbors necessarily um, about Jesus, that you'll be persecuted. No, it's about your right living. Why? Because it's an offense to the world. Jesus who was the most righteous man that ever walked the face of this earth, was persecuted, crucified, and killed and executed 
because he stood as an affront to other people's way of life. Not that Jesus pointed out their sin, not that Jesus said that they were wrongdoers, but actually by his own lifestyle, his own way of living, this this new way of living in the kingdom of God, it was an offense to people that they hated him because it shone his light on their darkness. When Jesus came into the world, he exposed the world simply by being righteous and the world hated him for it. I was... um, I mean, reading this book, I'll finish with this. Christy Wimber, Transformed. Um, if you've not got hold of this book, it's a brilliant book. Um, you know, we've, we've had Christy here a number of times, great friend of, of, of Trinity's. Um, she was here for the Books for Life Day. And um, I picked up a copy of, of, of this and started reading. In fact, Zoe and I both reading it. And it's an um, it's incredibly, incredibly liberating book, incredibly profound book. And uh, one of the things she says in the early chapters, I say early chapters because I'm only on the chapter on mercy, which is three chapters in. She says this, if our lives are becoming more and more like Jesus, we shouldn't be surprised that things get difficult. If our lives are becoming more and more like Jesus, we shouldn't be surprised that our lives are becoming more like Jesus. I wonder if your life is getting more like Jesus. I don't want you to have a difficult life. (laughs) But I wonder if my life is becoming more and more like Jesus. So God applauds those who are persecuted because they pursue the right way of living. And that's been a whistle-stop tour. I hope that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. But as I finish, I want us just to throw up this last slide. Because as the church, as the people of God, we live for His pleasure. We don't live for ourselves. We gave up ownership of our life. We surrendered our life when we decided to become followers of Jesus to make him Lord and Savior of our lives. We made a decision to live for him, for his applause, for his congratulations. So I wonder, where do we sit when God applauds us when we surrender? God applauds us when we weep for others. God applauds us when we have a posture of gentleness and patience. God applauds us when we meet the needs of others. God applauds us when we invite his cleansing. God applauds us when we work for peace. God applauds us when we're persecuted because we pursue him and his righteousness, his cause in the world. Amen. Let's stand. If you're new and you're visiting us, we don't need to leave to pick up children. We've got plenty of time. Um, Our celebration isn't ended. As part of our response to God and God's word um, in this place, we give time and space um, to just allow God's Holy Spirit, as I pray he has, to minister to our hearts, for us to be prayed for, perhaps for healing, whether physical or emotional, but to respond to God's word. Why? Because we believe in this place that the word of God says that the word of God does not return empty that the word of God goes out. The word of God is set forth, sent forth to fulfill its purposes. So I wonder, let's be still. What's the Lord been speaking to you about this morning? I just invite you um, to close your eyes. Maybe hold out your hands, which is a posture of receptivity. There's no magic to it, but... So often, our physical posture can so often help the movement of our hearts and our minds. And with the posture of hands open, we're saying, Lord, whatever you want for us, whatever you want to do in me and through me, I I want to be receptive to that. 
So Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who speaks, who works, who ministers the grace and love of Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you come afresh? Come again, Holy Spirit, on your church. I would encourage you not to disengage with God, maybe with your eyes closed, to ask the Holy Spirit, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about this morning? Maybe the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you about one of the specific Beatitudes. Holy Spirit, come. Just as we're waiting on the Lord, just in, um, you know, keep engaging with the Holy Spirit in prayer. But I just, I'm just going to share a couple of things. I think the Lord's perhaps um, wanting to encourage people to respond to in prayer. And so if, if, if this is you in a moment, I want to invite you to come to the front so that we might pray for you um, this morning. Because these things are matters of the heart, particularly and not going to ask anyone to ask you what it is that you want prayer for unless it's for physical or emotional healing perhaps but this morning I I, I felt the Lord was just highlighting you know perhaps for some people here this morning there are issues of pride if you know that for you that pride has just settled in your heart then in a moment I want to invite you to come to the front that we might pray for you I think as well you know that for you there's an issue of sinfulness that you know you need to invite God to come and purify that part of your heart if that's you this morning I want to invite you to come to the front in a moment again I said no one's going to ask you what your sinfulness is so it's not that we're not that kind of church Holy Spirit come I think um, as well I think the Lord is stirring people up for mercy I think there are areas of mercy in our world that God is stirring this church up for in new and fresh ways. I think some of it is for those in our community that we meet and that we encounter through our transform ministries, those on the streets, and those who are vulnerable adults or um, families in our community. I think God is stirring people up afresh for that. That's the mercy of God coming. I think as well there's a mercy of God coming to stir people up um, to um, to fight for the cause of human trafficking to fight against it to stand against it those who are trafficked in our communities I think God is releasing a, um, a real heart for that in people if that's you in a moment I want to invite you to come to the front so if the Lord's been speaking to you about those particular areas um, I want to invite you to come to the front now if that's okay just um, if you're upstairs just come down the spiral staircases if it's um, if you're downstairs just come to the front just come now that would be great 